All right, I'm gonna welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Tara Mastel and I work for Montana State University Extension. And I am joined today by my co-host Kaya Peterson and Kaya is the Executive Director of NeighborWorks Montana. So we're excited to talk with you today about rural housing. Um, first, a little bit about me. So I work for Extension. There's a lot of names that I had, I, people that are new to me, which is really great because we love to um, extend our audience. So in Extension, I work in the community development area, community vitality, rural community vitality is my focus. Um, the other things we work on within Extension in community development is community-based leadership. We run a remote work course. Um, we did the newcomer study that has been kind of in the news lately. Um, we also did the Reimagining Rural program, which uh, is really aimed at reframing our understanding of rural because uh, using looking at data and um, some migration trends and things that are happening, we have come to realize that rural is changing, rural is not dying. But through that conversation with Reimagining Rural, we are really looking at housing challenges, um, the housing challenge, and that's why we're doing this because housing is a problem everywhere. Obviously, you'd have to be living under a rock to not um, experience that. But uh, the solutions, the challenge and the solutions are different in rural. And so that's why we're doing this because we want to give folks some ideas of where to get started and what, what they can do in rural communities. Housing is really technical, it's very expensive, and it's a really complex problem with lots of different solutions. There's not one silver bullet. And the folks that have that technical expertise, they're mainly located in our larger cities in, in Montana and other places too. We do have some regional housing folks, but even those folks are, they are maybe one person and they have to serve all the communities in maybe several counties, some up to nine county, a nine county region. So uh, what we're gonna talk about is what, what folks in rural communities can do to get started on their housing problems, housing challenges. Um, so what we're, what we're talking about is something that you can all do together right now, you can get started and, and many of you already are. And what we're talking about is really gathering those that are impacted to get organized around the issue, elected officials, bankers, business owners, employers, community leaders. If you clarify your priorities, document the need, identify opportunities, you can make it easier and more attractive for a housing organization to come and work with you. So that's kind of what we're gonna talk about today. What we're, so just the agenda that we're working with is, um, I'm going to introduce Kaya. She's going to tell you a little bit about NeighborWorks Montana. We're going to tell you two stories of rural communities um, and what they did to get started on their, um, on their housing challenge. We're going to have question and answer after each of those stories. And we are going to assemble resources through this process, this webinar today, but also through all the rest of the, the other three that we have planned. We're gonna really look at your uh, feedback that you give us. And with that, we're gonna put together the January topic that we have planned. So with that, I wanna introduce Kaya Peterson. As I said earlier, Kaya is the Executive Director of NeighborWorks Montana. They're located in Missoula, but they serve the entire state and they are a partner in this series. We are excited to work with them more because they are very creative in their problem solving and they are seeking out connections in rural communities. So Kai, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Tara. Hello, everyone. It's so wonderful to see the interest in this webinar series. NeighborWorks Montana is a statewide organization. We've been working on housing affordability for almost 25 years. 2023 will be our 25th anniversary. And we were created really to solve, to serve communities like yours and to make sure that housing solutions and housing opportunities are available everywhere in the state. And the way that we do that is through partnerships. So we work with a lot of local nonprofit organizations, economic development groups, local municipalities to try to bring the housing counseling and education, the financial resources through our loan fund um, and our technical expertise and broad relationships and capacity to rural places like uh, 
um, where you live. So we've been really excited to um, find an avenue to partnering with MSU Extension. We've tried a couple of different avenues in the past, and this just seems like such a perfect overlap of current community needs and interests and some of the skill set and expertise that we bring. So, uh, you know, you'll hear more from me over the course of the webinar series, but you can learn more about us on our website, and I'm always happy to chat with any of you um, about your particular community needs. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Kaya. Okay, so we have two stories to tell you today. One is about the community of Gardner, and the second one is about the community of Boulder, Montana. And I am, since we are having a little bit of technical difficulties getting our second speaker, Bill Berg, on, um, but we have Katie, so that's good. Oh, there's Bill. So just so they can get acclimated, I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna just tell um, the story, we're gonna move the order around a little bit. So I'm gonna tell the story of, of Boulder, Montana and how they got started on their project. And then we will, um, after that, we will get into um, the Gardner story. All right, so just a little bit about Boulder. So Boulder is located, it's, it's you, many of you probably know this, but it's right south of Helena and it's about a half an hour from Helena and um, it's a lot of people commute into Helena. Um, so uh, the story that I'm gonna tell you is about my experience doing housing there when I was um, in extension, I, I'm still in extension, but when I was an extension agent, um, I had just started working in Boulder in, in Jefferson County and I just had that one county to serve. And this is how we got started on housing. So I came into the job in, um, it was in 2006. So this is a, a bit of a time time ago, but I, it's the, the parallels are quite similar to what's going on right now. It gives you a sense of what's going on, what, how you might as a community um, approach this issue and just get started, where do you dig in? So I was six months into the job and I was working, my focus was economic development. And I worked in community development, but housing was not, it's not my background at all. And it was not going to be my future. I, we, I had some time to work on it, but I was not able to work on it full time. At the time we had, it was 2006. So we had, um, the housing prices were going up really fast and we had 50 new jobs that were anticipated in Boulder, anticipated to be coming into Boulder. Um, Boulder has a high, a lower income. They have a high percentage of trailers and a high percentage of rentals. Um, and as I said, the housing prices were really going up fast. So as, as an economic development person in that, in that community, I was, I really was immediately looking at where can I get some help? And so I sought out help from the regional, um, housing authorities and I was, they, they told me that they couldn't help me because they couldn't help, even though Jefferson County was in their region, they were not able to help me because it was literally, it was too difficult to work outside of town. They had, their plate was full and all they, they had all they could handle in their, in their community right there. Um, and so I was forced to look at what else could I do as a non-housing professional um, working with volunteers. Everything that I sought out, everything, they need, there, there needed to be three things. We needed to identify the needs using survey or other data, put a plan together and apply for a grant. And I didn't feel like I had any of those knowledge, skills or abilities to do that. We, and even if we got a grant, we're not able to locate, to manage that locally. And I know that you all can understand that as um, if you were a small, a small community working on volunteers. Here's a timeline. So we started in August of 2006. So it was an urgent thing, Plant called this initial meeting, knowing nothing about what, what was going forward, but knowing that there was this upswell of really serious concern about housing in the community, called this meeting and, um, it, it, it clicked. We had 20 people that showed up on a week's notice. And from there, we formalized this task force. We acquired land, 
there were six homes that were built and we wrapped up the meet the the mutual self-help build that was happening so i'm going to go into a little bit more depth so i'm really sharing this with you as like how what is your first step what is the first thing that you can do and here's the actual agenda i dug through my files and i found this actual agenda it was held in the afternoon in august and we had 22 people show up and this is what we were shooting for i had no idea what we were doing i was terrified um, but we really just started out talking about why why are we here why are we here gathering talking about housing and then I asked people to introduce themselves and talk about why are they here and what is their concern. We then really brainstormed on what are what is going on, what are the needs in the community, and what are some solutions just based on the folks that are in the room. And then we went into kind of next steps. Just a little bit about who showed up. So we had retired teachers that were longtime community members that volunteered with everything. We had a bank employee, we had pastors, we had county commissioners, we had a representative from the paper, and we had other concerned citizens that were kind of active in the community. So that's kind of who showed up. And this is what we're saying that we're advocating that this is something that you can do as anybody, any role in your community. From there, we these are some of the needs that they identified in that meeting. So people wanted more affordable housing, housing under 100,000. Doesn't that sound like a joke right now? Um, people cannot make ends meet, more available housing, suitable housing. So not just for affordable housing, but even housing for um, more executive level folks. They needed some rehabilitation, more home ownership because there's a high level of rentals. Allow workforce to live locally. People wanted more families to boost school enrollment. They wanted people to be involved in the planning, focus efforts on current residents versus people that might be moving in. I mean, these are just, this is just a brainstorm, expanding city lots, because in Boulder they were small, um, and looking at controlling the growth. So then some of the solutions that this group of non-housing folks, just volunteers came together was um, new smaller homes for seniors that once they could move into somewhere more suitable, then their home was opened up for somebody else. Um, analyze income of residents to determine what to build, housing needs survey, what is what land is available, what loans are available, housing VISTA volunteer, focus on current residents, donated land. So these are just the things that people brought to the table. So this group that came together on this August afternoon, they formed this Boulder Housing Advisory Committee and they formalized, they elected officers and they created a resolution that they were recognized by the county commissioners and also the city of Boulder. And that's not, I'm not advocating that, that's just what they wanted to do so that there was a clear communication between the county, the county and the local government about what they could um, what the relationship was going to be with this organization. It also gave the organization some kind of some weight to it. Um, we soon attracted um, the attention of a nonprofit housing developer. Um, this is the National Affordable Housing Network out of Butte, who we worked with at that time. They had an existing grant and they were pretty interested in working with us um, because of our um, organization. This housing advisory committee, they developed some subcommittees Habitat for Humanity, Senior Housing, um, and then a, a, a Community Housing Assessment Subcommittee. I'm just going to share with you what, what we've got here. Um, these are some of the roles that that board played in the community, in the in this housing effort. So they promoted housing um, to potential homeowners because that is a challenge. Even though housing is such a need, getting the word out is hard. Um, they recruited and coordinated and communicated with the volunteers. They were the liaison with the nonprofit housing developer. They gathered data. They did uh, an assessment of the current situation and they. Um, 
also did a survey of housing needs with seniors. They also were kind of with all these folks, they were able to find opportunities. They were with all of their contacts, they found land availability, builders, people that were ready to build, buy rent, um, and also funding opportunities. Um, this is just a snapshot of, we put together a, a, a real estate overview. So here's what, this is just kind of like anybody could do this. We we got help from one of our local realtors to just get a rundown of what's going on in the market right now. We looked and uh, gathered some data on income and percentage of income. This was really interesting for Boulder. Um, we found out that in Boulder, 30% of the homes in Boulder were mobile homes. And of those 30% of homes, they were 97% uh, were over the age of, they were built prior to 1980. Through this process with this um, National Affordable Housing Network, because of the resources that they had available, um, we were able to build six homes in Boulder. And this is kind of what they, this is the model of home that they were. So that is just my little rundown of what we did in Boulder. And I'm wondering if anybody has any questions, questions or comments. And because we're using this um, web webinar format, we're gonna need to take the um, questions via the chat. So if anybody has any questions about this particular situation in Boulder, I hope it gave you an idea of how you can start, um, how you can get started. And, and once you get going and get organized and get your, your group together and kind of know what you need, then you can um, attract somebody like um, Kai Peterson's organization to help you um, get more specific um, progress on your housing. Does anybody have any questions or comments or, or reactions to this process that we went through in Boulder? Hi, this is, um, I got a question from Ross. Um, yeah, so I, the timeline, yes, Ross Reddick from Fort Benton is asking, how long did it take from getting the first home built? Um, so it was about a three year process, shockingly fast because of the nonprofit developer that we were working with, they had a, a grant ready to go. So we started, our first meeting was in August of 2006, and the homes were built and they were towards the end of 2009 and into 2010, they were moving into those homes. It was um, that process, the building process took long, um, took a little bit longer, but yes, that's, it was pretty fast. Um, Sean McGuire from Sweetgrass Development asks, how were assessments promoted? Who responded to the assessments? Is there a demographic that don't participate? I, I'm not sure what you mean by assessments, Sean. You mean the, um, Sean, just tell me what you mean by the assessment. The survey, the survey we had, the, we had the survey that we did, we had just the community members that showed up. I mean, they were just soup to nuts, all different kinds of people that were just concerned and they went out and did it. Um, they formed committees and did that. So Terry, did they do direct like door to door outreach or I think mm -hmm. the way I read his question is that's oh, okay. the Excellent. There. You know, yes, they, um, I don't know if they went door to door and there was different committees. So there was a senior committee that worked specifically to do a, a survey of seniors and they went to the senior center, they presented at the senior lunch and they had contacts within the senior community in Boulder. So that was, um, and then the, and then there was uh, an assessment committee that they worked independently. Um, my focus was really working with the nonprofit developer and the, the main thrust of that work of that, of, of my work on that committee was, um, working with the nonprofit developer and, and there was a, a fair amount of um, organization that needed to be done. But a lot of it was done by volunteers. And then there was another question here in the chat. How was the land acquired and were deed restrictions placed on the houses? 
Yes, I the so the nonprofit developer had money to buy the land and they bought the land all together and then they had to subdivide it. And that was a process because it was in the city limits and there were some challenges with the the um, the makeup of the land itself. So. Um, but the land, so this is the interesting thing is like the land was identified by somebody that had a personal connection, a personal relationship with the owner that had the land. So that's where you may think as you as a community volunteer or you're working with a group of community volunteers that you don't have housing expertise, but you have connections. You all know people in your community and you have those connections and you can bring in those resources all together. Today. That is definitely one of the amazing parts of working in Montana, I think, no matter where you are. There's yes, just all these different resources come together. So then there was a question here. How do you prioritize vacation rentals versus home ownership or potential ownership? You had a long list of community needs. So how did you get to picking something? Right. Working? Well, I mean, I think it was it was a, a mix between the what were the opportunities? and what was the main interest of the group. So there was this group that was really interested in senior housing and they went off and did their, their piece of the senior housing and they came back and reported back. Um, but the there was, you saw, you can't do it all. And I think that is also um, reflective of there's not one solution. And you have, when you're a small community, you have a small amount of resources. So, you, so we really focus in on the home ownership piece. And you did see that as a theme of those needs and the potential solutions. So home ownership was a big deal for Boulder and every community is gonna have it different. And at the time there were vacation rentals were not a thing, but this group was very interested in home ownership. They were interested in um, school enrollment, um, local home ownership um, places for current, current residents to move into a home ownership situation. Okay. Yeah, and I think from from my perspective too, there's a bit of there's all these different needs, and then there's what are the opportunities that are right in front of you, and what are the things that sort of naturally organically come together, and seizing on those and getting some early traction and momentum, knowing that this is a long this is a long game here. You're not going to solve all of all of those needs right out the gate, but one thing builds on the next. Right, and I think through that, getting that group of a wide range of people from all across the community that come together, you get you get a sense of what are the priorities, but you also get a sense of what are the opportunities. Somebody's gonna have land or they know somebody. The just the so in Boulder, this piece is was a large it, this the owner owned an entire city block and they were a little reclusive. Um, but somebody had a relationship with that person. And they might have been one of the few in the whole community that had a relationship with that person because they were, you know, we all have those quirky um, residents. And through that relationship, that's how we were able to purchase the land. It was not easy. It's challenging. But um, so, like I said, I just totally agree that what are the opportunities and where's the balance between the priorities of your town and the opportunities that present themselves? So there's a question here to me from Taylor. Any words of wisdom for what nonprofit developer, developers are looking for when deciding to work with communities across Montana? So I'm not a developer. NeighborWorks Montana isn't a developer, but we work with a lot of developers. And um, I think we'll have some opportunity in subsequent webinars to dig into this particular piece of the equation a little bit more. But I would say um, the numbers have to work. So you, there's got to be, you know, some resource or opportunity there that's meaningful, whether it's land or a building that needs to be preserved um, or honestly just community interest and um, a community that's willing to drive a little bit of the process and take a little bit of the work can, can go a long way. So I don't think there's any one answer, but I think it is sort of building on what, what Tara is sharing, which is bringing people together to just start to identify where are the real opportunities and then um, bringing developers along to that. And it's a pretty small group. So I would say, um, you know, it may not just be nonprofit developers who could be good partners in your communities. There may be 
um, for-profit developers out there too who have appetite and interest in, in development. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, so there was a question about infrastructure and because the infrastructure, because this, like I explained, this kind of was one um, unsubdivided city lot, the majority of it was there, there had to be infrastructure included and that was, um, that was included in the funding. I mean, it was, it was a challenge. It was challenging. I don't know that any of these things are challenging or not. Challenging. <laughs> I think, I think it's, it's, it's hard, but what do you, what's your alternative? You need, you need, you need housing for rural community vitality. You have to have a place for people to live. Okay, I'm seeing the question slow down. So I would like to turn it over to Katie Weaver and Bill Berg. And they are gonna tell you about a similar process that happened in the Gardner area. Um, let me just give a little introduction. Thank you very much for coming, Katie and Bill, and um, kudos to you for overcoming the technology issues. My apologies for that. Um, so Bill Berg is a county commissioner of Park County. He represents the Gardner area. He is a business owner, and he's now on the board of the HRDC. And Katie Weaver works with us at MSU Extension. She's an associate specialist. She works in community-based leadership. So Katie, prior to joining us, uh, she's been with us for a year in that role as associate specialist. She was with Park County as their community development extension agent. And she led their leadership program there and she responded to the community's request for help on housing. And she had a similar role to what I did with an extension. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Katie and Bill. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Tara. We could have used some of that information when we got started in Gardner. So I'm going to go back before I was a county commissioner. I was just a Gardner guy. Um, I was um, involved with the creation of a community council in 2011, became president of that in 2012. And uh, the Livingston Enterprise did a two part series on housing challenges in Gardner. So we had this brand new fancy community council. And we kind of looked at each other and said, boy, somebody should do something about that housing problem. I guess that's us. So we tried to figure out what doing something meant. And holy cow, I just took some notes on uh, some of your highlights and they really resonate with us. Relationships, champions, one thing builds on another, the numbers have to work. Um, yeah, we found that all to be true. We, um, we started to try to figure out who knew anything about affordable housing. We'd all been watching our community transform. At that time, we were really, really concerned about finding housing for teachers. Here we are um, in 2022, uh, enrollment in the Gardner School has gone down half uh, since 2014, when we actually had taken up with uh, HRDC, who we find found to be an active and productive partner in affordable housing issues. So we started with working with HRDC. Um, we quickly had some kitchen table meetings like you described, Tara. Um, our most passionate advocates and champions were parents. Never underestimate the passion of a parent because they saw their school struggling and they wanted to get their kids through that school. Uh, school is social, a social center of the community. Gardner is about 800-ish people. Uh, between 2010 and 2020 census, we lost 5% of our population, even as Park County went up 10%. Um, so we're really trying to hang on to our community. And you can't have a community without locals, and you can't have locals without housing. So it just seemed like housing was a real important place to focus. So we had organized a group of passionate residents, as well as some of the local business and government entities, uh, which included the Forest Service, the National Park Service. Gardner is really um, part of Mammoth. It's two park counties, it's two states, but Gardner Mammoth is kind of one community. 
which has been tricky this year because we've been severed by the flood. But uh, so we had the Park Service at the table, the Forest Service at the table. We had the big concessioners from Yellowstone Park at the table. Everybody has been and continues to struggle with uh, housing issues. Uh, and not so long after that, uh, a woman named Katie Weaver entered the picture. And Katie, I'll kick to you just a little bit. Sure, thanks, Bill. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, you hopefully see this slide in front of you. There's a lot of information here. And as Bill and I were talking about how we wanted to put this together, we wanted to kind of show um, how these initiatives really do take an investment of time and capacity. Um, I was new in my position um, as an extension agent, so there might be some of you out there who are extension agents or maybe working for a, a local development organization or a city or a county. Um, when the call for help came out, it was quite that simple. I think the email I got from Bill had a link to the enterprise article and said, how can you help? Um, so that was an exciting moment for me because in my position, I had some capacity, recognizing that not all communities have that. But, you know, identifying someone who can maybe go and do the footwork and help kind of bridge to those outside organizations, um, I think was really advantageous for us. And we heard that in Tara's example as well. You know, is there someone locally embedded who can really kind of help usher the effort along? So there was a lot of capacity and interest in people to coming together on the ground and Gardner. Um, and I was able to, um, you know, start doing some research and very quickly found um, a, an interested partner in HRDC and Tracy Menue. Um, so they are based out of Bozeman. Um, but, you know, I think we had some key pieces in place that um, made that, you know, I, I imagine a lot of, of the larger organizations and Kaya, you can maybe speak to this, um, get a lot of what we like to call tire kickers, you know, folks really interested and want to do something, but um, the ability to kind of really organize and put some of that human infrastructure in place, I think was really important. And I was happy to step in and support in that role. Um, so I started driving down to Gardner with Tracy and in those meetings that Bill was talking about. Um, and then it, it Tracy brought to the table the knowledge and the expertise that none of us had um, and really had just finished a housing needs assessment in Big Sky and said for a large dollar amount and was generous and um, kind enough to say, hey, if you all want to do this here, um, I think with MSU Extension's help, we can bootstrap this. And the group elected um, kind of at the end of those initial meetings, what do we do, where do we go, how do we start, um, made the decision to go that path with actually creating a formal report. Um, yeah, Bill, any, I guess, thoughts or wanna take it from there? Yeah, the housing needs assessment, which is something I'd never heard of before, actually became kind of a pivotal document and then we followed it up with a housing action plan. And I think, Terry, you mentioned that you actually had some developers start to look at your documentation, which um, was the same experience we had because now we had identified the need, analyzed the market, uh, reached out to the community, and we had an actual document that talked about who we were where we wanted to go, what tools were available, and um, and that was pretty critical. Uh, we also spent a lot of time driving around town with HRDC. Tracy was a rock star, and uh, looking at Google Earth just to find the, the holes in town. Um, and we had our eyes on several pieces of property, and things broke a little bit for us. It took a while before we had any, really any significant progress, and that was uh, from those passionate parents. Uh, after we got started, a group called the North Yellowstone Education Foundation stood up because they fiercely wanted to defend and protect, protect and sustain uh, the Gardner School. And uh, they were able through their relationships to get their hands on a piece of property. It was a former bed and breakfast that was put up for sale. The uh, person selling it was sympathetic to the cause. And the North 
Yellowstone Education Foundation was able to buy that for teacher housing with the help of HRDC. Um, so we kind of had some groups coming together and experiencing some synergy amongst themselves. Uh, then you also talked about champions and relationships. And again, that came to the fore when one of our community council members was uh, also an employee of Yellowstone Forever, who you may or may not know had some pretty serious financial problems. He got laid off, but he kept in touch. He got rehired eventually, but he realized that they might have to sell a pretty key piece of property inside Gardner that they had hoped to develop into employee housing just to meet their financial challenges. So he gave Tracy and others a heads up when when he got wind that they were indeed gonna put that property up for sale. And now here we are in 2022, HRDC has actually been able to acquire 4.6 acres of property in Gardner. And um, in a town of 833, um, that's gonna move the dial. That's, I remember when Katie and Tracy and I started talking, we were saying, boy, can we just have a walk or a single? And you know, this 4.6 acres is maybe a triple, I don't know. We'll see, we haven't broken ground yet. Uh, have already had committee meetings to make sure that the neighbors are aware of the possibilities and probabilities. We actually were able to take um, some money from our county ARPA funds to help with getting sewer and water to this property and um, are looking to get that going. But I, I firmly believe that momentum is sacred um, and um, these are pretty big steps. Um, no illusions though, you, I look at that timeline, it's almost embarrassing, it's been eight years. But um, you know, these things do take time and the only mistake is to not try. And it's not like we've solved this challenge. It's um, between fires, floods, pandemics, um, we've all been hit hard, Gardner has been hit especially hard, I would argue. Um, and um, yeah, this is gonna take ongoing work for some time. Probably anybody in Montana has seen a phenomenon since COVID where real estate will go for above asking price, cash, sight unseen. Um, so we are so far removed from any kind of connection between local wages and real estate prices that it's, uh, it's pretty tricky to find solutions here, but there are some tools and there are some folks out there with quite a bit of subject matter expertise who have been able to help Boulder, obviously, and Gardner. Yeah, and Bill, I would add to that, um, there's a lot of kind of like fits and starts. You can kind of see this threaded through the slide we have here. Um, there's been two areas of success, right? And Tara, you are correct. And NYEF is the North Yellowstone Education Foundation. Um, and HRDC were able to make significant impacts, right? Like tangible impacts on the housing challenges. Um, the communities tried a lot of other things. And I think that's important um, to kind of have that mindset of you need to try things and sometimes there's something there and sometimes there isn't and that's fine because a lot of the solutions that I think are gonna be working are kind of out of the box and they really need to be housed in this idea of momentum and developing and maintaining relationships. Um, so a couple I just wanna point out is um, the school and Gardner became very active and actually started looking at its own property. Um, it worked with the MSU community design, uh, CDC community design center um, out of the School of Arts and Architecture and students were analyzing, could you put housing on the school property? Um, so a lot of work was done there and I'm not sure where that stands, um, but you know, that was another kind of piece in momentum. Um, a relationship between Zantara, who's a large um, employer in the area and HRDC enabled them. And I think Park Service as well. Um, HRDC had purchased, I think in about 2016, some um, self-contained units from the Bakken and was repurposing those into small homes. And so some of those homes were able to be put in the area for employee housing. Um, and then one other thing, again, lots of solutions. Uh, the community, a small group came together to start considering 
a housing investment co-op. Um, and I don't know if you're touching on this in a later webinar, but that is a really interesting kind of community democratic investment model. Um, and as Bill mentioned, gardeners kind of had, you know, a handful of challenges really face the community. Um, in addition to being um, a seasonal community, right? So when, when it is in season, businesses are kind of going around the clock. So um, capacity, I think, was a limiting factor there and some external factors to really gain momentum in that housing investment cooperative. Um, but that's an idea that's still out there that at some point might gain momentum again. So lots of different things the community tried. Some of them really kind of stuck and there's momentum there. Um, but just knowing that, you know, honestly, it might take many multiple years and a lot of different approaches um, before your community finds something that actually will work. Can I just jump in, Katie, and just please? So um, we've been following the work of Ben Winchester from the University of Minnesota Extension and what he is saying, and I think it's really true, is that housing in rural communities, it's really nobody's job. Like um, Kaya's organization and the HRDC, like they have these regions, but they have to serve every community in, in the region. Um, it's really nobody's job. So it, it's up to, in rural communities, it's up to the community members to kind of come together and make it happen. If you don't work on it, the solution is not, prob I mean, it, you, you gotta, you gotta work on it to make it better, even though it's, it's, it can be challenging and it can take a long time. Do you want to talk about, um, I know we have a lot of um, volunteer groups, volunteer community members on the on the call, Katie, do you want to talk about how important volunteers were into making this happen and how much work would it take as a as a volunteer organization to make something like this work? Sure. And all this is kind of a nice transition. We had a um, a slide here, if I can progress it on uh, lessons learned and lessons used. And I think that'll kind of tie into that question. And then Bill obviously jump in. Um, yeah, I, I was fortunate to have some actual capacity in my regular regular job to support this, but all of and HRD, HRDC and Tracy Menue and the folks that came after her, everyone else in the mix was a volunteer. Um, and so, um, Bill, I want you to maybe talk a little bit more about that, but just like kind of eyes wide open. It was we were fortunate that it was a mix of some people being paid to do the work. Um, but nothing would have moved forward without those volunteers. And Bill, it was over eight years or so, where is the timeline we're looking at now? You wanna kind of talk about what that was like from, cause you started as a volunteer. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and I'll, I'll just throw in that opportunity bullet point too, because we had created that community council in 2011. Um, we had kind of, fired up the Chamber of Commerce the year before. We had started actively working with the Park Service on a, a modest proposal for some infrastructure improvements in Gardner in anticipation of the centennial of the National Park Service in 2016. And some of the seeds we planted actually got to be kind of big. And we were able to take the capacity and relationships we developed in that project. And they were a huge advantage as we started to focus on housing because we had these connections, we had established, I'd like to think, some credibility and attention and uh, we're able to kind of build on that with just another focus about our town. Um, so, yeah, champions, huge, fierce parents, get out of the way, opportunity, embrace it. Uh, relationships, work and play well with others at every turn. It really matters that you are recognized as people who can get things done and aren't difficult to work with. First steps, yeah, momentum is huge. Um, Katie, and I shared with Katie a, a formula for change that I came across in a webinar a few years ago, and it was uh, D times V times F has to be greater than R. And D is dissatisfaction, and V is vision, and F is first steps, 
And if you multiply those three together, if any of them is zero, you don't go anywhere. And then greater than R is resistance. So, yeah, first steps is pretty key. And for us, I think the first step was the needs assessment. Sec second step was the action plan. Third step took a long time. Oh, my gosh, we have some teacher housing. And now in 2022, it's full of teachers. Uh, third step, 4.6 acre piece of property. Let's get some students and families back into town. And yeah, that last one, importance of the document, it's fine to just wave your arms and talk about, oh my gosh, we have a problem, but get people together, put it down on paper and give yourself a little bit of a vision and a guiding framework. Yeah, and, and Bill, can you just mention, because I think it's timely, this idea around it was an anchor for funding. So having that document how has that helped the community um, with what's happened in the last over this last summer with flooding? Yeah, it's uh, it's already stale information because that you know the 2015 was when it came out. The world has changed at least a couple times since 2015. Simultaneously and not unrelated, Gardner started working on a neighborhood plan uh, with a fit out of Bozeman called Future West. Uh, which ended up resulting in a bunch of passionate community meetings and fights over language and identifying what our acute needs are. And um, I was sitting down with a FEMA team a week ago, and they're working with state DEI, DES on infrastructure recovery from the floods and economic and community recovery from the floods, everything from sewer and water systems to houses that are still at risk to uh, mental health and economic health and what's the winter going to look like given that nobody had an opportunity to fill their cash registers this summer. And they stumbled across this neighborhood plan, which is still in draft format and just kind of mentioned that that's kind of everything. They really didn't have much of a baseline to work off of, but the neighborhood plan, again, the importance of documentation and again, it's just a draft. I want to throw in just a hot topic, too, because I saw it in the chat a little bit ago. Short term rentals. Um, I have a friend who uh, is very wise and he says for every complex problem, there's a simple solution that's wrong. And uh, it's really easy to demonize short term rentals and pretend that they're just one thing. Uh, they're a really hot topic in Park County right now. Uh, and actually pretty divisive right now. Uh, you know, I've learned in this job since I became a commissioner that there are several four letter words uh, in Park County anyway. One is zone, one is plan, another is tax, which is obviously a four letter word. And then there's a four syllable word, regulate. And I'm learning you gotta be really careful when you throw those words out there. And in the housing action plan for Park County, which is still in draft form, um, you know, it lists 12 potential tools, one of which is regulating short term rentals that got a lot of attention and has drawn a whole lot of public comments. And I knew before all of that, that short term rentals have become a essential tool for many families to be able to make their house payments, put their kids through college, pay their medical bills stay in the community and have a reasonable shot at retirement. Um, so it's a tricky topic that I don't think we can afford to ignore, but I think it's really important to recognize that they come in all flavors. And you might argue that some are really good for the community and some of those flavors, maybe not so much. Yes. Some um, any, does anybody have any other questions or comments or reactions to um, Bill and Katie's discussion of the situation in Gardner, how they got started working on housing? I posted the link to the Gardner housing plan, and I think Katie said this, but I'll just reiterate it. They modeled... They did it. They bootstrapped it. They did it themselves. They they took the uh, the plan that was re that at that time was developed in Big Sky at a very high cost by consultants. 
they took that and they did it themselves with what they knew right now. And as I, as Katie shared in the beginning, she was not a housing expert and there was a housing expert from the HRDC that helped, but um, they were not, they did it basically for, for nothing. So you can do that too. Um, we are sharing in, when when you leave this, you're going to go to our website. When you when you exit out, it, it'll it should drop you off into our website, um, our community development website for extension. And we put on there some resources, and one of them is is the house. Well, we have this posted there too, this link to the Gardner Area Housing Plan. But we also have a link to the Headwaters Economics um, tool that they have, where you can. Enter. It's free. It's amazing. You can enter in your jurisdiction, and they will. It spits out all this really great information. So it's a great way to get started. Any other comments or questions for for Gardner on how they got started? I just wanted to call out. So Kim, Chris, Cripps up in Haver had asked about the role of volunteers, and Katie and Bill, you both touched on this a little bit. But any really direct advice for people on the call who may be in that willing, eager volunteer position, but just trying to figure out how to get that initial traction or where to start? Uh, the magic word organize, I would guess. Katie really helped us with that. Um, but yeah, when, when I look back at this and other volunteer efforts, it really does take one or two champions. I mean, there are some people who are willing to stuff an envelope or set up for a meeting, but you need a couple quarterbacks to use a sports metaphor. You really do. I mean, I would advocate that you look at, we talk about this in extension and we can help you with this, but mapping out your community, just gra grabbing a few people that are that are there with you that want to work on this and just kind of take take some time and just map out okay who what are all the organizations in our community what are all the assets that we have and do we have somebody representing each of those organizations somebody or a few people so you can get as good of a cross section involved as you can um, because if you don't do that, you are going to be down to one or two people and it's just, you're simply not gonna have the, the knowledge of what's, what are the opportunities, the access to resources, just the simple um, people power that you need to, to make some things happen. Um, one thing that I, I know was an issue in the two situations that I worked on as an extension agent um, in Whitehall and in Boulder was that it, even though there is such a housing crisis, it was actually challenging to get the word out about the opportunity. You, ha you needed a lot of people to say, hey, this is an opportunity. Um, so step up, you just, it, the more people you have, the better solution you're gonna come up with. And I would just add a little to build on that, like stepping back and thinking who's really feeling the pinch here, right? And going back to Bill's um, uh, formula for change, there are people in the community who are feeling this in an acute way. Um, and so thinking about how you involve them from the beginning, you know, um, anyone who's a large employer is feeling this um, in probably most communities. So your hospitals, your school districts, your cities, your counties, um, your developers, your, you know, your contractors. Just thinking of it in a very holistic way of like who is feeling the pinch and then who has assets to bring to the table and maybe just investing some time and having coffee with those folks and seeing are they really um, are they really motivated to find solutions here and i think you find two three four eight of those folks and it'll be um more likely you can gain some momentum so Bill and Katie, one of the things I was really struck by in your timeline and in your path is the way that you created systems and institutions to support your work, a housing committee, a foundation. What role did that sort of formalization and institutional structures play? How did you decide to go that route and what role has that played in maintaining, maintaining this long-term momentum you've had? No. They say you can't have uh, 
character in your community without characters. And we have a lot of characters in Gardner, and a lot of them are just single actors who will show up with a great idea or maybe sometimes not so great, but really hard to get them to show up for, um, to put themselves out there to serve on a board or go to a meeting of one of the community organizations. Um, there's so much more you can do if you have you know, that structure 501c3 is obviously helpful for fundraising, but a credible board of directors, a mission vision, uh, and um, a group with an identity, you know, NEF, North Yellowstone Education Foundation, they stood themselves up really quickly and quickly, and they were quite aggressive in cultivating the attention of the superintendent of Yellowstone, the Montana delegation, Schools resonate. Again, these were passionate parents fiercely defending their kids and their school. And yeah, you know, it's it's a big lift to create something from scratch. Uh, and then you live and die by your reputation, just like we all do. And, um, you know, just having having a voice of a credible organization gives you so much more capacity than just a few individual actors. I'll just, I, uh, oh, go ahead, Kitty. Well, and I would just add a little, you know, I think there's, um, we're not necessarily advocating go out and do a housing plan, a needs assessment and a plan. You know, I think at, at the local level, you need to make those decisions yourself. Uh, but it was, you know, it, I, I know a lot of communities are feeling what Gardner was really starting to feel in a big way about a decade ago, but I think it was complex enough that there was a very early on recognition of we need to do this in a way that is setting us up for success in the future. And that was the advice we got from HRDC. Um, you know, any of the programs that you might go after or any developers you might try to attract, they're going to need real numbers, as you mentioned earlier, Kaya. You know, they, these projects need to pencil out. And so that starts with a clear understanding of where is the community today? Where is the need? And then that is a foundation for moving forward. Um, and then you can bring in all the different programs that support this, whether they will work in your community or not. You know, Gardner is an un unincorporated community. So a lot of the tools that are in the toolbox don't work there because there's no necessary, there's not a local government that could actually act upon those. The county stepping in and playing um, some of those roles, but I think having that conversation early on in, um, you know, are we really wanting to actually do the work that sees houses built or a hotel purchased and turned into apartments? Um, I think there's some need to build a structured response from the beginning. So when those opportunities come knocking, the community is prepared. Yeah, I do think though that having having some of those documents pulled together, like we did in Boulder, we did a, a little survey and we modeled it, we Googled it and modeled it after what other communities had done. And then we had some data and those sorts of um, efforts that you have. And if you can, if you don't have to be an expert, just put it together in a written format that you can email to somebody and it shows an organization that might be able to, they're being pulled in many different directions, like every housing organization or every housing professional in Montana is right now. If you pull, if you show that you're reliable, you're organized, you have some data, it's going to show them that you are a good bet. You are worth spending some time there and they will be able to, I mean, hopefully they can find some time to work with you and, and help you, um, Help you move forward on whatever challenge that you're trying to solve because it is really different in every community. Yeah, I think that really resonates with me, Tara, that having some local capacity and um, organizing strength goes a long way. So I'm not seeing a whole lot of other questions, um, some that weren't. Um, answered is we will have a recording available and we will share the PowerPoints. Um, somebody, uh, Steve Simonson 
out of Billings talked about the community land trust model and I'm pretty familiar, I mean, somewhat familiar with that. We There's a housing project here in Red Lodge that used that model. Um, so we can share a little bit about that and maybe we wanna, we, so we have this last session scheduled for January and we felt like we modeled, we picked these topics based on feedback that we got from the Ben Winchester housing webinar we had in August. So we left that last one open, I guess it's February. We left that last one open and maybe we include the community land trust model. That's a, a where the land underneath the home is owned by a nonprofit organization. So that when somebody, when somebody is buying a house, it just takes that land price out. It's, you know, and it sounds scary, but how many how many cabins are own are there on Forest Service land, or National Park land? But they're owned. The cabin is owned by a family, and they it's passed down from generation to generation. So that's um, something to think about. We can if there's if there's more interest, we can do that. The housing in Boulder that I talked about. I don't know that I mentioned this uh, because we were having some tech issues, but um, the housing was a mutual self help build. It's a USDA program where they. Um, the people buy their houses, but they do put in, they build a fair amount of the house themselves and they build it together. So um, that is an interesting model. And they did that here in, Bol in Red Lodge as well. And with the community land trust land underneath. I'm going to just show, share what we've got here for our last, our, we've got um, some sessions coming up. Kai, do you want to talk about the, the last, the next one that we have? Yeah, so our next session in this series will be on November 30th, and the focus will be on improving aging housing stock and maintaining supply. So we're still working on the final agenda for that session, but looking at potentially having some conversation about the investment co-op model that was raised earlier. Um, there's a preservation map that the state has developed and a toolkit that NeighborWorks Montana has been working on that we're excited to share with you. Um, and then potentially some conversation about rehab. That's the aging housing stock is definitely a theme and a need that has come up over and over again. So that will be the main focus for November 30th. And then you can see there January 25th, developing new homes, increasing supply. So that's where we'll get back to the question of how do you attract developers to work with you in your community and what's working for new development. And then like Tara has said, that February piece is open to um, feedback based on these sessions. Great. Okay, so that's what we have for you. Um, I hope this has been helpful. Yeah, I just wanna say it's really exciting to see such a broad um, group of participants from all over the state. And part of our hope here with this series is to really sort of demystify this housing world. It can be so overwhelming to figure out where to get started or where there are opportunities. But I, I just hope that you're coming away from this feeling like there are some steps that can be taken and there are resources and there are people out there who want to help address your community's needs. So. Um, looking forward to continuing with these conversations and see where that leads and how we can be helpful. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Oh, Bill says the North entrance to Yellowstone will be open next week. Oh, that's exciting. Excellent. Well, thanks everyone. Let us know what you thought, send us, drop me an email. Um, and, and we're, hopefully you can join us for the. The next one, it looked like most people registered for all of them. So you can, you'll get that um, automatic reminder. Thanks for coming. We're excited to move this conversation forward and help you all um, make the communities, uh, make housing more available in your community. So thanks so much.